Last time. Last time we showed. Kind of echoey. I guess it's all right. Last time we showed that you can choose coordinates. In which Okay, so we showed last time that you can always choose coordinates at uh, such that at a given point, the metric is just the Minkowski metric um, up to second order in x corrections. Okay, so space time can be uh, thought of as being. Um, Locally flat. This is what we mean by locally flat. Flat is this guy. There's no second derivatives. Uh, and these second derivatives we call the curvature. Okay, so in, in this and the next uh, lecture, we'll be developing this idea of, uh, of a curved space-time where the curvature is described by these uh, second derivatives. So before doing that, let us uh, step back a little bit and just discuss general properties of tensors um, under general coordinate transformations. Okay, so we've already discussed uh, special relativity, where we required that everything be described as a tensor under Lorentz transformations. But when we do general relativity, we want everything to be a tensor under general coordinate transformations. So an example would be a scalar, some quantity with no indices. And the transformation of a scalar is just that the value of the scalar at a given point is equal to its value at the same point in the old coordinate system. OK, so you should picture it like this. Here's your, your curved space with the metric g there is some point P um, in, in the coordinate system uh, X. So let's draw two coordinate systems. OK, so this will be one of them. This will be X. So we describe the point P using some particular coordinates the x coordinates, but if I come along and change coordinates to x prime, then of course it's true that x prime, the, co the coordinates of p in uh, the coordinate system x prime is just equal to this function of the old coordinates and the, and the labor, the coordinate values of the point P in the old coordinates. Okay, so it's just important to realize that the, the point may be at, you know, some particular value like 1, 2, 3, 4 or whatever in these coordinates, but in these coordinates some completely different value, x prime is 3, 4, 5, 6, and so what you require is this, a scalar field takes the same value because x and x prime refer to the same point. Okay, so we have uh, phi p, phi prime of x p prime is phi of x p.
Okay, so that's a scalar, uh, the scalar transformation law. Uh, likewise, we have uh, vectors. And here we have two kinds. The ind index can be up or down. And V mu prime Uh, uh, etc. Okay, so the rule is there's always one of these Jacobian matrices for every index, and uh, it's dx prime dx if the index is up, it's dx dx prime if the index is down, and uh, and so on. So the number of upstairs indices and upstairs indices are called contravariant indices. And the, num the number of downstairs or covariant indices define the type of tensor. For example, T mu nu lambda rho sigma equals tensor of type two, three. Okay, two upstairs, three downstairs indices, and uh, and so these numbers just describe how many. Jacobian matrices you need and how many inverse Jacobian matrices you need to describe the transformation law. So the metric, what kind of tensor is the metric? Two zero. Okay. Sorry, zero two. <laughs> zero two. I get zero. And the inverse metric is two zero. Now, how do we get tensors from tensors? Okay, so if we have a bunch of tensors and we want to make some other tensors. Uh, how do we do that? Well, there are several operations we can use. We can add them. And so if two tensors are a tensor, are tensors of the same type, then their sum is, so if, we, if uh, t mu nu plus s mu nu is a tensor uh, m mu nu, of the same, same type. Right, that's obvious that if I prime everything, I need the right Jacobian matrices in front of these two guys, and those are going, going to be exactly the right ones to transform M. So you can add tensors to get other tensors. You can multiply them. So I can calculate, uh, for example, T mu nu S alpha rho. That's a perfectly good tensor, right? That's a tensor M mu nu alpha rho of type 2, 2. You can uh, contract 
And so contract is just an example of multiplying where I choose to sum over these indices. So T mu nu S alpha S nu rho. So that's mu just multiplying them and summing over the index nu. And so that's a tensor M mu rho of type 1, 1. Now, uh, there's another operation you can do, which is to differentiate tensors, because uh, we know that, we know that uh, d by dx mu, or partial derivative, is a vector. So let's try to differentiate a tensor. because we know that d by dx prime mu is dx alpha dx prime mu d by dx alpha. Okay, partial derivatives transform as a tensor of type 0, 1. So you might be tempted to write down this. And obviously all the equations of physics are differential equations. And so that's the very first thing you want to do if you want to write down some equations for physics using, um, actually almost all. All the equations of classical physics are differential equations. Uh, the equations of quantum physics are better thought of as integral equations. But uh, for classical physics, you want to differentiate things, see how they evolve in time and space. And um, so... You might be tempted, for example, to take your phi of x, right, and differentiate it. And uh, so the question is, is that a vector? Is that a tensor? Let's say we define v mu to equal the gradient, the four gradient of phi. Is that a tensor? Doubtful. Well, how do we check? We, we write down v mu prime, which is d phi prime of x prime, just prime everything, right? And then we know phi prime of x prime is phi of x, and we know d by dx prime is d x alpha dx prime mu d by dx alpha. Okay, so yes, it's a tensor. This is exactly the right transformation law. So uh, v mu prime, so this equals v equals dx alpha dx prime mu v alpha. So indeed, it's a tensor of uh, type um, 0, 1. Okay, so having... Uh, having made a tensor like this, let's make another tensor. Let's imagine I, uh, I have some, some vector. Let me call it something else, just so you don't confuse it with this. Let's say we have um, uh, b mu nu, d mu a nu, where a nu is a vector, it, it, a tensor of type tensor of type uh, 0, 1. So the question is, is that a tensor of type 0, 2? Okay, now something goes wrong. Can you tell me what it is? Let's, let's try it again. B mu nu prime is D prime mu A nu prime. But now this has a Jacobian matrix, right? So I get d mu prime of 
dx dx prime mu <coughs> alpha a alpha. That's the transformation of a. Okay, and um, so what I'm going to get when this term, of course, differentiates the a, and that will give me the right kind of term because this will give me the x alpha, the x prime nu, the mu. Well, I'm going to differentiate a with respect to x prime. Okay, so how do I do that? Well, a is a function of x. So I write the derivative with respect to x prime as the Jacobian times d by dx, right? So this gives me uh, dx beta dx prime mu d beta a alpha. So that's a good term. That's exactly right. That, so differentiating the a gives me exactly the right transformation for a tensor of type 0, 2. But the problem is I've got to differentiate this guy as well. OK, so I get an extra piece. So I get uh, d2x alpha dx prime mu dx prime nu. Um, a alpha. That's nothing like a tra tensor transformation law, so that's bad. Okay, so you cannot differentiate a tensor with non-zero number of indices and get another tensor. That's quite bad because it means you cannot write differential equations uh, involving tensors with a non-zero number of indices without some further correction. So, uh, so, B, so B mu nu prime is not a tensor. Is not a tensor. Okay, so again, this is something Riemann encountered that it's not so easy to define uh, tensor differential equations uh, in this more general setting. And so you need a fix. And the fix is called the connection. So we redefine the derivative. as follows. So the idea is to change your definition of derivative. We're not going to use partial derivative. It's not a good operator. Uh, it needs a correction. And we're going to redefine the derivative so that I'll first do it for a vector, d mu a nu. This is the covariant derivative. It's covariant because it's got one downstairs index. The covariant derivative of some vector a, by definition, is the partial derivative of a. By the way, I've slipped into this notation of not bothering to write the x. Right? d mu is just d by dx mu. I hope that's clear. Um, and so the meaning should be clear of all these things. Um, so the, you see, we've got a nasty extra term here, so the idea is subtracted off. So we define something like this. Okay, so this is an extra piece which gamma is the connection. Okay, so gamma is the connection and its role in life is to make the derivative into a tensor. 
Okay, so actually gamma cannot be a tensor because it's trying to correct a term that isn't a tensor. And its whole point of gamma is to make the sum of these two terms tensor. Okay, so the transformation law of gamma, so by definition, Sounds like a terrible fix, doesn't it? Didn't work, so I just uh, introduced something to fix it. But we'll see that there's a whole string of consistency conditions which, which nicely fix what gamma is. Okay, so by, de by definition, um, uh, gamma prime nu alpha mu by definition, gamma does not transform as a tensor. It's not a tensor. It transforms using two pieces. First of all, the first piece is exactly the tensor piece, so that would be dx prime nu dx delta gamma delta, let's say lambda sigma, and then these two downstairs indices transform with... Um, x prime alpha, d by d, x prime mu, x lambda, x sigma. Okay, so that's the normal tensor transformation law. But um, we want to add to this something involving the second derivatives of the transformation, and we want the something to exactly cancel that term. And so... Uh, the right transformation turns out to be x prime nu dx rho d2 x rho uh, dx prime alpha dx prime mu. Okay, and I picked the minus sign exactly, so this this will cancel that term. Um, let's just uh, check that. So we've already transformed this term, and so basically this term gave us a tensor plus an extra bad piece. Uh, so this term gives us uh, d2 x alpha d x prime mu d x prime nu a alpha okay so tensor plus tensor term plus this guy and this term is going to give us the tensor term I've only transformed gamma but a transforms as a vector anyway. So the combination, the, the tensor terms are all going to be right. Okay, there's an extra term, which is minus uh, that. Uh, dx prime, uh, now let's see, have I got the indices? Oh, I need to redefine all the indices. dx prime lambda, dx alpha, d2x alpha, dx prime nu, dx prime mu. Okay, I just relabeled all these indices. And then the A transforms according to dx, dx prime lambda, x beta, A beta. Right? And what happens, you notice this is, I've got the Jacobian and the inverse Jacobian contracted on the lambda, right? So we have dx prime lambda, dx alpha, dx uh, it should be in, yeah, sorry, dx beta, dx prime lambda. Well, that's just delta alpha beta, because that that's the derivative of x beta with respect to x alpha. Right, x, x is a function of x prime. So if I differentiate x with respect to x prime and then x prime with respect to x, I'm just differentiating x with respect to itself. That just gives me a delta. So this term here 
the delta alpha beta changes this index, makes these two indices equal. So I get exactly minus d2x beta dx prime mu dx prime nu a beta. And that cancels this. Okay, so any questions about that? I introduced some weird object, not a tensor. I just defined it to have this nasty transformation law, but I decided defined the nastiness exactly to cancel the other nastiness. Okay, sounds like a terrible cheat. In fact, in gauge theories, in field theory, you do exactly the same thing. <laughs> okay. The point is in a gauge theory, uh, so you have the wave function in quantum mechanics, and you would like invariance under local phasing, local rephasing, where theta is a function, any function of space time. And then, of course, you find that the derivative of phi goes to the derivative of this guy. equals e to the i theta of d mu plus i d mu theta phi. That's the bad term. It means that physics is not locally invariant under redefining phases. And so what you do is you change this to covariant derivative, which by definition is d mu plus i a mu. And then you define the a mu, a mu prime. So this is psi prime. A mu prime is A mu minus D mu theta, and uh, it cancels the bad term. So that's the transformation law. In fact, you know, we, we did this in, in, we noticed this was a symmetry of special relativity. We changed A in this way, the field strength was not changed. This is a redundancy in the gauge potential. In the same way, in general relativity, we have a redundancy in the coordinates. We have a connection. So A is the connection in gauge theory. Uh, gamma lambda mu nu is the connection in GR. Neither of them are particularly physical things. Uh, what is physical in the gauge theory is the field strength. Even that is not very physical in non-abelian gauge theories. You have to do a little bit more. But in general relativity, gamma is not physical. You go to this curvature, the Riemann uh, curvature. Yes? So if those things cancel out, it's, it's just the derivatives equal to zero? No, 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 sorry. Um, the, the, sorry, uh, wasn't clear. So we define the derivative this way, the new derivative. It follows that d mu a nu prime, right, which is d mu prime a, a nu prime. It means just prime everything. This is equal to dx dx prime dx dx prime alpha beta d alpha a beta, right? So, so this is a tensor of type uh, zero two. That's what it means. Because remember, all the tensor terms I just ignored because they're all sort of obvious. They all do the obvious things, but they all do the right things. The only point I'm all I'm showing here is the bad terms all cancel if you define the connection this way. How do people come up with this stuff? Raymond. <laughs> how, how can you find that? Did he have, did he just like try for yeah. 10 weeks until something canceled? Yeah. <laughs> but it'll be a little bit, this is not the, uh, this is not the answer. This is, this is at this point just a fix. You still have to understand what the hell is this thing? We don't know what it is. And we're going to determine what this is in terms of first derivatives of the metric. You remember the first derivatives of things are a little bit flaky anyway, because you can remove them with a, coordinate transformation. This thing is a bit flaky, the gamma. And we're actually going to determine the gamma in terms of the first derivatives of the metric. But at this stage, gamma is not determined. It's just 
something which transforms in this strange way. That's what a connection is. Why is it not a tensor? Sorry? Why is it not a tensor? Because as this bad term, this is good. This is a tensor transformation law, mm -hmm. just using the Jacobian and the inverse Jacobian. But gamma transforms, by definition, involving second derivatives of the coordinates. It's just a bad term. But you need that bad term in order to make the covariant derivative a tensor. This was not a tensor, so you've got to correct for it. So think about gamma as a correction instead of a connection. <laughs> it's really there just to correct the derivative. But yeah, as you say, it's actually pretty mind-blowing to think of uh, some PhD student in uh, 1820 or whenever it was fiddling around with this. Uh, I mean, at that time, even partial derivatives were not really very well understood. Certainly physicists didn't know about partial derivatives. It was only in Ma Maxwell developed the theory of partial derivatives. Okay, so Riemann was pretty, pretty far ahead of his time. And then, you know, poor Riemann. I mean, Riemann died and never knew that the world <laughs> is described by this. Okay, so um, let us now fix gamma. So what is gamma? It's still very mysterious. Oh, but before I do that... Uh, we've only defined the covariant derivative of a tensor of type 0, 1, right? Vector with downstairs indices. What about... What about this? Right? Let me just be difficult and define the derivative of something with an upstairs index. Well, it's pretty clear I get the same problem, right? It's just that I'm going to have the inverse Jacobian matrix here for the upstairs index guy. So I'm going to differentiate that. I'll get another bad term. OK. So, so this time, it turns out, you get a different bad term. Um, so yeah. So again, d mu, ordinary derivative of the nu, is not a tensor. So we introduce a gamma correction. And I'll just tell you the answer first and then justify it. So we define d mu v nu to be equal to d mu v nu. And this time you have to put a plus. Gamma, turns out the same gamma does the job of correcting. You don't need a new gamma. And you line up the indices in a slightly different way. So the derivative index always comes on the bottom. And my convention is always to write it second in gamma. When you read uh, different books and review articles, you'll find everyone has different conventions. Uh, 10 physicists have 10 conventions. Um, which is very annoying, but we're not engineers. So <laughs> uh, no one's using bridge, this to build bridges, so uh, we, we don't have to be consistent. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's still annoying that we can't reach agreement of what, what the right convention is. But anyway, um, I'm going to do it this way, and I'll try to be consistent to keep the derivative index second. You see, that's what I did over there. The derivative index is the second one downstairs on the gamma. And then once you make that choice, everything else is fixed because the, you need a downstairs index, which, which is the new. So I put that on the gamma, and I contract the upstairs index of the gamma. I've got to get rid of it, so I, I can, all I can do is contract it with the A. So here I have a different problem. I've got an upstairs index. And so I use the other in downstairs indices on the gamma to contract the V. So that at least looks at it like it has sensible indices. 
and uh, this this turns out to be a tensor. of type uh, of type one one okay so let me just show you how that works and why I need the plus sign um, to see that let's go back back to that bad term in gamma uh, Let's go back to this bad term in gamma. You see, the structure of it is pretty logical because gamma is something primed. Its indices should be primed. And here the free indices are on the x prime, right? So it's just dx prime, dx prime, dx prime. These are the free indices. The x is the contracted guy. OK, so it sort of has this uh, tensorial character, even though it's not a tensor, but the prime indices are the free ones. Um, when I uh, consider a vector with a upstairs index, it goes with the inverse Jacobian matrix, right? So instead of, uh, I'll have dx prime dx instead of dx dx prime. So it's useful to try to re-express this in terms of dx prime this is d 2x dx prime squared. It's useful to re-express this in terms of dx prime. Um, I'll just write down the answer and then, well, I may not get the indices right. Yeah, uh, I want to re-express in terms of d2x prime dx dx. You see, the go th this term was cancelling the d2x dx prime squared. What I need in the other case is d2x prime dx squared. It's clearly related in some way. How is it related? So the way you relate it is realizing this is kind of the derivative of this identity, right? If I just dropped one of the derivatives there, I would have this. Uh, yes. I dropped the new der mu derivative. So I have this quantity. Now, what's that quantity? This is prime. What is this quantity? This index contracts with that, so it's dx prime dx prime. What's dx prime dx prime? Pardon? Delta, delta, exactly. So this is delta nu alpha. So that's really a simple thing. And this is basically its derivative, except I've forgotten to differentiate this guy. So what that means is I can get an identity out of here. If I differentiate this with respect to mu, right? then this is zero, because delta is just a constant, so it doesn't depend on. So this is zero. So now we have our identity. And again, this is a trick uh, which we use in GR all the time, is differentiate identities to get other identities. And so here what I've got is d2. Um, let's do this one first, because this is a d by dx prime. So dx prime, let's do that one first. D, uh, sorry, dx, d2x rho, dx prime mu, dx prime alpha, and then with this guy, dx rho. That's the first term. The second term, now here I've got to differentiate d, d by dx of something. So I should think about x prime as a function of x, but that means this d by dx prime I should re-express re in terms of d by dx. So I write it as dx dx prime mu x alpha, and then d by dx alpha of this, which is basically d2 x prime nu dx rho dx rho dx prime alpha. Okay. 
So yeah, you, you do get headaches from doing a lot of these calculations. <laughs> but I can assure you, once you're, you do enough of them, you'll get happy with them, I hope. Uh, all of this is zero, because the right-hand side is zero. So that means we've now succeeded. We've expressed this derivative d2x dx prime squared in terms of d2x prime dx squared. Okay, and so using that, the bad term in the transformation of gamma, so this guy over here, so dx prime uh, new d2x rho dx rho dx prime alpha dx prime mu is equal to minus uh, d2x prime nu dx gamma dx rho dx gamma dx rho dx prime alpha dx prime nu. OK, so this bad term in the transformation of gamma is related to the bad term you will get in um, when you take the derivative of an upstairs index thing. And here's the minus sign with this minus sign. OK, so using this identity, uh, I hope it's plausible that defining the downstairs derivative in this way is also gives you a tensor. The bad terms will cancel. And to demonstrate that, you need to use this identity up there. I'm not going to go through it in detail. But I've showed you there's a minus sign, and it's that minus sign that accounts for this minus sign. OK, so, uh, so that's nice, and that's what Riemann did. And furthermore, having uh, corrected the derivative for downstairs index objects and for, for with one index and upstairs with one index, it's not difficult to do it in general. So in general, uh, if a alpha beta dot 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 is a tensor, and the dots here just indicate any number of indices. Uh, let me keep them ordered. So some number of upstairs indices and some number of downstairs indices. Disadvantage of chalk. Alpha, beta, let's say gamma, delta is a tensor right, with any number of upstairs and downstairs indices, then the covariant derivative of it is defined to be the ordinary derivative and then what should I do? How do you think I correct it? How do I add the connection to this formula? I'm going to use a connection to ensure that this is a tensor, right? Now, it should be pretty clear that every time I have an upstairs indices, I have a certain Jacobian, a Jacobian, and I differentiate and I get a bad term. Every time I have a downstairs, I have the inverse Jacobian, I differentiate and get a bad term. So I get a number of bad terms just equal to the number of indices. Each one of them I've got to cancel. The bad terms from the upstairs I cancel with the plus gamma, the bad terms from the downstairs with the minus gamma. And so this is the general rule. And so the upstairs ind indices, we always do the same. So the derivative index comes last, and it's at the bottom. The gamma basically takes that upstairs index, right, the, which was alpha, and corrects it. So it contracts with the upstairs index and puts it back. And likewise, the next term would be gamma 
beta, uh, lambda, mu. This time we leave the alpha index alone and we contract the beta index and put it up. Okay, so I guess I should have put these betas here. Delta. So every time you use an upstairs index, you put a gamma, and every time you have a downstairs index, you put a minus gamma. Uh, so, and this time again, the, index, the order is obvious. You put the derivative index last on the gamma. I leave all the other indices alone. I contract the downstairs index and put, put it here. Right, etc. Okay, so that's the covariant derivative. Big question. What is gamma? <laughs> okay. What equation should determine gamma? We know what kind of thing it is, but how do we determine it? It's not a tensor. It's, it's a little bit of a flaky object. How do we determine? Well, the first point to make The anti-symmetric part of gamma, which, remember, we defined the anti-symmetric part to be this, gamma right, the anti-symmetric part of a tensor is just obtained by taking the tensor and flipping the indices and putting a minus sign. Um, actually, this is a tensor. And you can see that because the bad term is symmetrical under the lower two indices. The bad term is symmetric. Bad term in the transformation of gamma is symmetric uh, under alpha goes to beta. Right? Why is that? Because you look at the bad term. It's up there. It's the second term. It's symmetric under alpha and mu, which are the lower two indices. So I take gamma alpha mu minus gamma mu alpha. That bad term cancels. So this is a tensor. All right? So that, that we could, we, we're going to give it a name because it's a tensor. deserves a name. Uh, we call this the torsion. Uh, T, lambda, alpha, beta. Tensor with three indices, anti-symmetric under the lower two. The simplest assumption you could make in constructing these derivatives would be T lambda alpha beta equals zero. Okay, because that's really a tensor. So I've written down a meaningful equation. The tensor, the torsion is zero. It's obvious, though very, very powerful fact, but an obvious fact, that if a tensor, so obvious but powerful theorem, which we'll use actually many times, theorem. If a tensor is zero in one coordinate system, then it is zero in all coordinate systems. Okay, 
that's an obvious thing because the tensor transforms with the Jacobian matrix. The Jacobian matrix is invertible. So if the tensor times a bunch of Jacobian matrices is zero, then the tensor is zero. So that's true. So if the tensor is zero, so if, the, if I set the torsion zero in one coordinate system, it's zero in all coordinate systems. I could just forget about it. Never, it will never arise. Something which is which I set zero in any coordinate system will never come back to bite. Okay, so that's a good equation, and uh, it's the simplest thing you can do. Just throw away the torsion, right? Now, in fact, when uh, this is what everyone did in general relativity, in general, except for very few people, in the late 1950s, people started... See, general relativity had a very strange history. It was invented in the te, uh, 1915. There a few little tests were done, bending of light, um, perihelion shift of mercury... We may discuss that next week. These are completely mind-blowing predictions, which turned out to be true. And then people thought, God, this theory is so difficult. It's very difficult mathematically. It's very difficult to test. And they lost interest. Okay, so it wasn't until the late 1960s that there was a revival of interest. Uh, sorry, the late 1950s, there was a revival. And on the one hand, you had experimentalists like Ray Weiss, starting to think, you know, I want to actually detect gravitational waves. And it essentially took them uh, 50 years, over 40 years at least, to build the devices which finally uh, succeeded. Do you know he's coming to give a colloquium? November 30th? It would be very exciting. So uh, he's an amazing character. <laughs> I don't know if you saw any of you saw the LIGO announcement. Did you? In Washington, do you see it? The webcast. So he was there, and he held up a piece of wire fence. <laughs> it was very funny. He was demonstrating a gravitational wave with a piece of wire fence, which I think he must have picked up on the, you know, in some junkyard. <laughs> anyway, so he'll be here to give the colloquium. But anyway, people lost interest in GR. So on the experimental side, they very, very brave people started to get interested in the sixties. On the theoretical side, people started to try to couple this to particle physics, right? They, they wanted to reconcile gravity with particle physics. So people like John Wheeler, who was at Princeton, was a theorist, revived all this. And of course, his PhD student was Richard Feynman. And uh, I was very fortunate that Wheeler was, uh, when I was at Princeton, Wheeler was there. I used to drive him home after the colloquia because he... Uh, wasn't allowed to drive. He was too old. <laughs> and uh, uh, amazing character, the nicest person you could meet. Um, but he tried to couple general relativity to, you know, to fundamental physics. And that essentially led Feynman, it actually was that work that led Feynman to formulate uh, QED in the late 50s and path integrals and so on. So a lot came out of that. But uh, when they did all this, have you heard of somebody called Kibble, Tom Kibble? So the Higgs, you've heard of the Higgs. So the person who made Higgs, one of the people who made Higgs realistic, uh, inf invented, discovered how to do spontaneously broken gauge theories was Tom Kibble. And Tom Kibble, in the early 60s, connected gravity to fermions. Dirac fields hadn't really been studied. And when they did that, what happened? The torsion came back. <laughs> okay. So it turns out that in some ways of doing gravity, when you put fermions in, in the sort of simplest way you can do, actually the fermions create this torsion field. And ever since then, people, off and on, people reintroduce. So it's actually needed in some versions of gravity plus fermions. Uh, one of those versions is supergravity. It's 
not a realistic theory, but it's a very nice mathematical theory. And that needs, needs torsion as well. Okay, so that's just a long diversion to say that some people are interested in torsion. It may be there in the real world, but the simplest option is just to set it zero. If we set it zero, then in a very simple way, we can fix what gamma is. So all that words is just to say one can assume gamma is symmetric. There is no torsion. So if we assume torsion equals zero, then gamma equals gamma and gamma can be determined from a simple condition namely so I want to write down an equation which connects gamma to first derivatives of the metric, right? The first derivatives were the flaky things we could remove with coordinate transformations. Gamma is a flaky thing. I want to connect these two things. All right, what's an equation I could write down which will involve gamma and will involve first derivatives of the metric? Derivative Say again? Derivative exactly, okay. So let's just write this down, see if this makes sense. Obviously, it involves first derivatives of the metric. Obviously, it in involves gamma. Let's see what happens if we set that equal to zero. All right, so this is, this is a kind of appealing idea that the quantity I use to fix the geometry, the metric, does not itself have a first derivative, right? So that's basically telling you that if you take the dot product between two vectors at one point, and if those two vectors are constants, the dot product is not going to change, right? So if I take a dot product, g alpha beta u alpha u beta, or v beta, uh, if... Right, so what is this quantity? This is u dot, u dot v. Um, if the covariant derivative d mu v alpha, d mu u alpha equals zero, so that's the only sort of meaningful way to say that this is a constant vector, is that its covariant derivative is zero, and d mu v beta is zero. So if these are two constant vectors, then, um, yes, actually I didn't, uh, I haven't uh, emphasized this, but it, it is true. If I take the co covariant derivative of u dot v, this is a scalar, no indices, right? So this is equal to d mu u dot v. And what I'm arguing is that if the u and the v are constants, ideally I'd like u dot v to be constant. All right, at least that's appealing, that I'd have some geometry in, in, that, in which that was true. So uh, what is this equal to? Well, this is equal to, the, the, so this is what I want to emphasize, the covariant derivative obeys the same law as an ordinary derivative in that if you differentiate a product, it's the sum of derivatives. So this is equal to, so let's just write that out, g alpha beta u alpha v beta. This is equal to 
d sorry equal to d mu g alpha beta times it's distributive the co covariant derivative is distributive just like the ordinary derivative plus g alpha beta d mu u alpha u beta or v beta plus g alpha beta u alpha d mu v beta. So this is a property. Covariant derivative is is distributive. That just follows uh, from the definition. Uh, if you work these things out, um, you will see that the uh, connections, you see here obviously I'm going to get two gammas with, with uh, minus signs, because G has two lower indices. Here I'm going to get one gamma with the plus sign, one gamma with a plus sign, and you check these just cancel. So the covariant derivative has that, the same property as a derivative that the derivative of a product, covariant derivative of a product is just a sum of the terms where you differentiate each thing. So given that uh, if these terms are zero and I want uh, this to be zero because I want the scalar product of two constant vectors to be constant. It follow, for arbitrary vectors, this is a v, for arbitrary vectors u and v, it follows this must be zero. So that's an appealing property that the metric doesn't uh, somehow, yeah, doesn't change uh, covariantly uh, across space, space time. So this equation is called metricity. I think that's a more modern word. And uh, some brave people like uh, Lee Smolin and Laurent Bridel uh, like to imagine that the metricity is not zero. And then you can do, try and do experimental tests to see whether this is indeed valid. Okay, so they proposed uh, that the metricity not be zero in order to create some interesting effects in cosmic ray uh, physics. Uh, so far, all the evidence is against those interesting effects, but uh, nevertheless, interesting idea. Okay, so if we impose this metricity equation on the metric, the claim is this fixes gamma. All right, so let's just see that. This is d mu g alpha beta, two downstairs indices. So I've got minus gamma and then another minus gamma. Uh, I first use the alpha index. So this is g lambda beta. And then I do the beta index equals zero. That's the equation. Does that equation look a little bit? I want to solve for gamma. Does that equation look a little bit familiar? It's an equation which is symmetrical in two uh, indices, the alpha and the beta. Right, so the, it's symmetrical under alpha changes to beta. Um, these, these two terms are uh, just related by exchanging alpha and beta. So have we seen an equation like that before? We did last time, remember? We solved for something called L. Symmetrical in the two downstairs indices and one. In fact, it's the same equation. So how am I going to solve that equation? It's a limited number of algebraic tricks. Add two more equations. Add two more equations, OK? So I leave that to you just because time is running out. But obviously, what we do is we, 
what do we do? We cycle the indices, all right? Plus, so basically we're going to do a plus of the same equation. Oh, it's like, yeah, let me think. There was a logical way of thinking about this, but uh, let me do it without the indices. <laughs> okay. So we add one version, we subtract some version. Okay. Uh, th this is, by the way, in the printed notes. You, you, may, you may know this. There are some printed notes. They're not properly proofread, I warn you. So I, I take, I, I don't guarantee their correctness. But, um, so you add and subtract the same equation, and it turns out lots of terms cancel. And, uh, and then what we find is that gamma lambda alpha mu is equal to g lambda beta g uh, alpha beta mu plus g mu beta alpha minus g alpha mu beta. Okay, and that is often called this uh, funny symbol which is the Christoffel symbol. I can do the algebra if you really want me to, but uh, it may be more fun for you to try it. Let me know if you get stuck. Um, and, uh, and so that's that. With, the, with this extra assumption of metricity, which is kind of plausible because you want scalar products to be preserved for vectors which are covariantly constant, with this extra assumption of metricity, gamma is completely determined in terms of first derivatives of the metric. Now, I told you last time, we can always choose coordinates in which these first derivatives are all zero. Okay, so what happens in that coordinate system? In a coordinate system where the matrix first derivatives are zero, what is gamma? Zero. The gamma is zero in the coordinate system where the first derivatives of the metric are zero. Is gamma zero in all coordinate systems? No, why not? If it was a tensor, it would be. So if a tensor is zero in one coordinate system, zero in all coordinate systems. Gamma is not a tensor. No need for gamma to vanish in other coordinate systems. So, um, okay, so in fact, next time we will see, you will remember that I showed you that in an acceler a uniformly accelerating coordinate system, right, a freely moving particle actually accelerates. And that acceleration comes from the gamma, right? So gamma is the fictitious gravitational force created by a coordinate transformation. That's really what it is. Um, it can be removed by a coordinate transformation, which takes you back to the freely falling system. So that, so locally in any region of space-time, gravity doesn't really exist, doesn't have any influence at all. Everything is special relativity. Gravity can be removed. The only way gravity comes into physics is if you look at regions of space big enough that the curvature of space-time matters. The second derivatives can't be removed and, and, and become significant. And that's all described by the Riemann tensor. So next time, having fixed gamma in terms of the metric, next time we're going to fix the Riemann tensor in terms of the gamma. It's just like in uh, electrodynamics, a mu is the connection. That's analogous to gamma. And the field strength was a physical thing. That was the electric and magnetic field. So the field strength is analogous to the Riemann tensor in gravity. Okay? And just like the field strength is d mu a mu minus d nu a mu, so Riemann is some kind of anti-symmetrized derivative involving gamma.
These are very close parallels. So I hope as, as you understand the subject, you will in a way realize that Maxwell was the one who made the big breakthrough. Right? When Maxwell found how to write the laws of physics as a set of PDEs with this huge symmetry, that was a very, very profound impact. And Einstein was doing nothing more than just doing that for gravity. Okay, so Maxwell's the one who should get all the credit. In fact, Einstein always gave Maxwell the credit for his work. And Maxwell gave all the credit to Faraday. <laughs> because Faraday was the experimentalist who, although he had no maths at all, he sort of intuitively realized there are things called fields. Um, and uh, that's where Maxwell got the idea from. I'm sure Faraday would give the credit to somebody else. <laughs> Not sure who, but uh, uh, any questions? Where did you use the fact that the torsion is zero? Why did I use it? Where? Oh, uh, well, uh, to get gamma being symmetric. Okay, so in this calculation, if gamma was not symmetric, um, the terms wouldn't cancel. The, remember when we did this calculation for L? Yeah. It was very, very important this was symmetric. <laughs> it was not symmetric. You couldn't solve these equations uniquely for gamma in terms of dg. Okay, so it's the, it's the vanishing of the torsion that enables you to express gamma in terms of first derivatives of the metric. Otherwise, it's undetermined. You see, the way to think about it is torsion really is a tensor. It's a new object. It, you should think about it as a physical field, like an F mu nu or something. If there's some torsion there, there's really some extra physics creating it. There's nothing you can... It, so the theorem is if a tensor is zero in one coordinate system, it's zero in all co coordinate systems. The converse is if it's not zero in any coordinate system, it's non-zero in all coordinate systems, right? And so it's going to be there to muck up everything you're doing, whichever coordinates you use. So, and, and that's reflected when you work out these equations. You simply can't express gamma in terms of this alone. What, of course, what happens is you can write gamma in terms of this plus tension, torsion terms, plus some extra terms involving the torsion. And then you wonder what fixed those. All right, so you get this framework which has an extra physical field and you don't yet know what fixes it. In theories with fermions and supergravity and so on, there are other principles which would fix the torsion. But if you just do plain GR, um, you, you, there's nothing stopping you from setting the torsion to zero and that's the simplest case. So I think torsion is, torsion is definitely very interesting, but you know, A, there's no evidence for it. And uh, B, the theory without torsion makes perfect sense. So different people take different attitudes. You know, some particle physicists like to say there's this whole kind of effective field theory dogma, which says that all operators which, should, which could be there should be there at some level. Right? That's one. You'll hear these words a boringly infinite number of times. Okay. <laughs> Uh, that philosophy would indicate you should leave the torsion in until you know it's not there. And, and you know, that's okay. But uh, there's another philosophy to, to, which, which is the opposite, which is, said, which is to say, let's keep things as simple as possible and not introduce extra fields uh, or, or, or couplings until there's evidence for them. And I would have to say the second philosophy is winning right now. So like this idea that everything that can be there should be there at order one is losing very, very badly. Uh, nature seems to have lots of uh, conspiracies to keep things simple. And we don't understand those conspiracies yet. So uh, nature is not just some random theory. Uh, it, so I would say we don't really understand why the torsion is zero, but... Uh, uh, there's no indication for it, and it's totally reasonable at this point just to ignore it. Yeah. If the if there's you happen to get lucky, for example, mm. find a coordinate system where gamma is zero. Yes. Doesn't that imply the torsion has to be zero? Uh, torsion. Ah, that's a good. 
is the transformation law for gamma. It's yeah, so that's a good course. point. Uh, well, let's see. So there's a bit of a contradiction here, isn't there? Um, Without assuming... No, no, wait a second, wait a second. Uh, this is the statement. <laughs> okay, so if you find a so if you find a coordinate system in which gamma, ah, wait, wait a second. That's only local. It's only at one point. Yeah, gamma is zero at one point. At one point, mm -hmm. yeah. So we couldn't always find a coordinate system where gamma is zero at a particular point. So the torsion is zero at that point, and that will be, let me think. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't that imply that I could always yeah so I guess you're saying the torsion um, yeah it's a good question I'm just, I'm just thinking about what you can learn directly from right the event. right it's a good question let me think about it any easier questions <laughs> or any harder questions. If you're in 1D, can you always transform to a flat space globally? Yes. So, um, in 1D, so what is a 1D metric? It's just a function of x times the x squared. Actually, usually when, I call it a metric, what we usually do is write a line element. We think of that as a more physical object than the metric, because that is g mu nu dx mu dx nu. So that's, that's the proper distance. That's a physical distance between two points separated by dx. Okay? So the line element is this. Now, in one dimension, it's just that. The, the reason this is nice to think about it is, of course, this is invariant under coordinate transformations. Right? So this, let's call it ds squared. So ds prime squared in some other coordinate system is g mu nu prime dx prime dx prime nu. But of course, this is just uh, dx dx prime with lower indices. g alpha beta and then dx. Uh, th these are uh, transform with the, uh, with the Jacobian. So dx prime. Okay, and then this, these guys cancel. So the line element is invariant under coordinate transformations. So it's always nicer kind of to think about this quantity. So the statement is that in one dimension, the line element's always of that form. Okay, so what I'd like to do is write it as dx prime squared, because that's a trivial line element. That's flat space in one dimension. So can I do that? Yeah, it's easy because, well, let's imagine this is a square of something, so it's positive. Remember, to do geometry, you always require the metric is invertible, and you fix the number of positive and negative eigenvalues. So if we say this is a metric in 1D, it has one positive eigenvalue, it must be the square. And so all I do here is I say, dx prime is equal to f of x dx. I can solve that equation. x prime is integral. Right? So, uh, so it just says in these coordinates, the metric is flat. So in 1D, it's trivial to make the metric flat just by choosing coordinates. But if your manifold is like one closed circle, doesn't it need to have curvature in some sense? No. <laughs> A circle is flat. <laughs> A circle is flat. Why? Because the metric, let's say theta is the angle on the circle, and we can do it just like we did the two-sphere. We can work out the induced metric on the sphere. It's just d theta squared. And uh, this metric has no curvature. So uh, it has an extrinsic curvature, but not an intrinsic curvature. So if you're completely confined to the circle, you really can't tell. Now, what it does have is a non-trivial topology. You know, if I compare a line, a straight line, going from minus infinity to infinity, well, first of all, it has two ends, which this doesn't have. And secondly, it's infinite. 
So the circle has, has a non-trivial topology, but the topology is a totally different property than the geometry. The geometry is always a local property, and it's determined by the metric. And so these two have the same geometry, but different topology. So when you study GR, we're only studying the geometry of space-time, not its topology. As far as we know, the universe could be topologically non-trivial. I could travel over to the other side of the universe and reappear on that side. That's allowed by GR. Okay, so it could be like a torus. You could you could go around and come back. And as so a topology and geometry are are related but different things. So certain topologies allow certain geometries. Um, but um, the geometry does not fix the topology. So 1D is always trivial. You just change coordinates to coordinates in which it's just a line with Euclidean geometry. This is Euclidean geometry. 2D, uh, there are various facts, you see. So in 2D, there's another theorem which is analogous to this. Remember in 2D, I told you the Riemann tensor only has one component, right? We proved that. We proved that we can set all second derivatives of the metric to zero except for one in 2D. This relates to the fact that in 2D, you can always choose coordinates. So it can always choose coordinates in which g mu nu is equal to some function of x times eta mu nu, assuming Lorentzian. If it has one negative and one positive eigenvalue, you can always choose co coordinates, in, and this is called conformally flat. So, so 2D geometry is always uh, conformally flat. The only sort of interesting description of the geometry is a single function of x, which is just the overall stretching of space. Okay, there's, there's, there are no interesting angular deformations in, in 2D geometry. It's all just a stretching. And so that's, as you know, people study conformal field theories and all that, and they work most beautifully in 2D. Uh, and that, that's related to this fact. All 2D spaces are conformally flat. 1D spaces are all flat, 2D are conformally flat. 3D, a little bit more comes in, but no gravitational waves. There are no gravitational waves in 3D. Uh, only when you get to 4D, you get gravitational waves possible. And the geometry becomes you know, much more interesting. Any other questions? It has to be zero. Oh, I'm just saying, okay. It's an assumption. It's assumption. So, so if I want uh, u dot v to be zero when d mu u alpha equals d mu v beta equals zero. So if I have some vectors which are covariantly constant, in space-time, and if I would like these conditions to imply this, then I must have that the metric derivative is zero. Okay, so it's only an assumption. It's just it's a simplifying assumption. But the other statement is, you know, if you have torsion around, and you have two vectors which are covariantly constant, what? Physically, some examples would be the spin of a particle, you know, particles following, following some trajectory through space-time, and its spin is a half, and it's constant. Now, if you have another particle with another, sp where spin is some constant vector, you have another particle, and they're moving along, and if you want that dot product not to change, um, then you better not have any torsion. The torsion is going to change that inner product. So again, saying it's really something physical. It's a quantity which could exist, um, but uh, it can be set to zero, and that is the simplest theory, is uh, no torsion. 
Can you give an example of curved space in 1D, then? No. There's no curved space in 1D. The, the, you can set all the... You can always just do this in 1D. So give me any metric you like in 1D. Give me a metric. I mean, I could have done it this way. I could say G11 of x is, um, is f squared of x. And then all I do is a coordinate transformation. G11 prime of x prime, right, is just... Um, dx, dx prime, dx, dx prime of, um, of this, f squared of x. And all I have to do is choose the dx, dx prime, so I just choose dx, dx prime to equal to 1 over f of x. And that's just the same as this equation. That's dx prime. Partial derivative is an ordinary deriv derivative in one dimension, so dx prime is f of x dx. So in other words, it's, it's these factors that allow you to just remove any non-trivial x-dependence in 1D. But uh, in higher dimensions, you can't. Any other questions? I think you need a break. All right, see you tomorrow. Bye.